it's always good after you've seen a, a powerful film to have a moment where we can talk together about what we just saw and how it felt like and how to understand it all. Uh, but it's not every day that we have the chance to do that conversation with the filmmaker and two of the protagonists in the film. So we're very lucky tonight, guys. So please join me on the stage. Uh, welcome to Dia, Pardeep and Arno. Come up. Sharing is caring, so we'll share the microphone uh, tonight. Um, Dia, I wanted to ask you first, um, you say repeatedly in the film that you were making this because you wanted to understand the, the hatred that they were feeling. Now that you made this film, do you understand it? Um, I think... Uh, I think... Photo. I just have to be louder. Um, so I think I understand some things. I mean, I, I don't think I understand everyone's reasons, but the people that I came across, I would say, what I do understand is that a lot of this comes from pain. I think it comes from um, human, emotional, psychological um, dynamics, much more than the ideology itself. Obviously, the ideology is important, but I think that that's just sort of a superficial layer that people dress themselves in to compensate for whatever vulnerabilities and whatever pain that they might be going through. And I think Arno actually says it beautifully towards the end of the film, is that you know he sees right through to their suffering. And, and I would say that that's absolutely the case. That's exactly what I found as well. And in some ways, um, that was difficult maybe to discover, but also quite hopeful, because I think that that tells me that we can do something about that, you know? And, and this film, I've also done a film before this which was about jihadis, and I have to say that the similarities between the two groups of men has been absolutely astonishing in my eyes. Um, the kind of men that are drawn to these types of movements, the kind of men that this movement actively targets for recruitment as well. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of similarities, I think. Um, and it's all based in vulnerabilities that young men Feel, whether it's a matter of emasculation or, or not being able to you know, deal with shame or feelings of humiliation and, and instead finding a way to sort of compensate or equalize that through this hyper-masculine, hyper-macho, violent, aggressive, domineering um, kind of expression of who they are, uh, which I think is really interesting because that's something that I found is absolutely the case with both movements. So this is very interesting and this was kind of your motivation to do the film, to try to understand that. But what did you want the movie to do to others, like to us who, who sit sitting here tonight and watching it? What was your motivation for that? My, my motivation is never really what my films necessarily are going to do to other people. It's first and foremost my own kind of obsessive curiosity uh, that I'm trying to satisfy. Um, but what I, what I hope with, with the work that I do kind of in retrospect is just a possibility of having a conversation that's a bit different, having a conversation that can get beyond our kind of self-righteousness and our kind of, um, you know, it's very easy to be angry at people like this. It's very easy to hate people like this. Uh, and it's very, it feels really, it's, it's, it feels really good in some ways. It's very satisfying to pat yourselves on the back and say that I have all the right opinions, I have the correct politics, I have all the correct friends, and these idiots just don't get it. But that doesn't really, to me, that's not satisfying truly, because we're not really getting to the source of what's really going on. And if we don't do that, then we're ultimately not going to get to a place of solutions. And so the reason I do the work that I do is to find the human beings behind the ideology, behind the chest beating and the slogans and, 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 um, and the name calling, and to see if not only if I can find their humanity, but also am I able to hold on to mine in the process? We can talk a little bit more about this, but uh, Arno, you were one of those human beings that the uh, yeah, is, is was trying to understand. And uh, we learn a little bit about your story in the film, but um, uh, does the description the is uh, having now of the people in this movement, does it fit you as well? Is that the reason? Why did you join this movement in the first place? Dia's descriptions are spot on. Like, absolutely spot on. 
And it, in my case, the reason I got involved in white supremacist hate groups was because I was suffering. And it's important for me to say that my childhood is pretty idyllic. I never want to talk like, oh, I was beaten, I was starved. Um, I know Frankie Bank, like Frankie's childhood sucked. My childhood was a church picnic compared to his. But the point is, is that suffering is a relative thing. Um, my father wasn't abusive. Nobody ever laid a finger on me. I lived in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. I never went hungry. I never took a beating. My parents were together. They both loved me very much, and they let me know that all the time. All the adults in my life would, like, fawn over me about how wonderful I was and what a genius I was. But my dad's an alcoholic. And his drinking put a lot of pressure on my mom. And my mom was miserable. And I could tell that as a kid. So I started lashing out at other kids. Hurt people, hurt people. And, and the fact that there are like literally billions of children on this planet who would have happily traded childhoods with me, it, what does that matter when you're six years old and you're hurt because your mom's sad? But there must be something else as well. I mean, many kids do have, unfortunately, parents that are alcoholic, but what were the other circumstances that kind of made you? Well, that's a great point. I, I said hurt people, hurt people. We do like workshops to that effect. That's pretty much like our go-to workshop is exploring that topic. And I was actually doing this with a bunch of middle school kids, like 12, 13 years old. And one of the kids is like, yeah, but Arno, not all hurt people hurt people. And I'm like, oh, um, yeah, that's actually a really good point, isn't it? Um, all human beings suffer. We all go through trauma. And if we haven't, uh, we're very likely we will at some point. Fortunately, most human beings have a healthy way to process that trauma so it doesn't get transferred to other people. And I, I had every healthy way to pro process trauma like handed to me on a silver platter and I never engaged with any of them. And I, I think that's like a flaw of my personality and just kind of like how things shook down for me. But that, that was my failure is I didn't engage with any of these healthy ways to process trauma that were offered to me. In the film, you you mentioned that one thing that happened that uh, started making you go out of the woman was that you had a daughter. Mm -hmm. What was it that made you kind of decide to leave the movement? How did that affect you? My daughter was the, the catalyst. I, I was in hate groups for seven years, and by, honestly, like very early on in my hate group days, I was exhausted already. Like, I knew what I was doing was wrong. I knew it was wrong to hate people and hurt people. I, it was exhausting to kind of keep living in denial of this inner knowledge of my wrongness. Um, I, it was exhausting to cut myself off from the rest of society, which you have to do in order to adopt a fundamentalist mindset like that. What was most exhausting of all, though, was when people, brave people like Bia, who, who refused to let me dictate the rules of engagement in our, in our interaction, people who treated me with kindness when I least deserved it. People like a Jewish boss, a lesbian supervisor, black and Latino coworkers, refused to capitulate to my hostility and hate me back as I wanted them to. And instead they treated me like a human being should treat another human being. And even though none of those interactions changed me on the spot, they planted seeds that made it more and more difficult for me to maintain the kind of hate you need to hurt people. So by the end of seven years, I was literally looking for an excuse to leave. I didn't know what it was going to be. I needed an excuse because in the movement, like, I was a big deal. I, I was a rock star, right? I had groupies. Like, people all over the world knew who I was. They were afraid of me. They respected me. Outside of the movement, I'm like a high school dropout alcoholic working a minimum wage factory job who can't maintain a place to live for more than a couple months because he's such a drunk and has a habit of passing out and pissing all over himself. Like, that's who I was in real life. So it, it, it was an intimidating prospect to leave, but I, I, I knew it had to happen. And the, so the, the catalyst that finally brought me to that point where I'm like, now's the time to go, was becoming a single parent. Um, when my daughter was about 18 months old, her mother and I broke up. 
go figure, but hate and violence and alcohol is not a recipe for a healthy relationship between a man and a woman. And I found myself a single parent. And a couple months after that, a second friend of mine was shot and killed in a street fight. At that point, I lost count of how many friends have been incarcerated, and so I was like, I, I have to leave, or this is going to take me away from my daughter. And, and uh, Pradeep, to bring you in also, I mean, you're also one of these uh, brave people that uh, Arno is mentioning now, uh, of reaching out, even though many would, you would say you had any, like every reason to hate white supremacists after one of them killed your father. Um, what does it take? Uh, to reach out to the other side if uh, or meeting the enemy, like the yeah, Colser movie. Yeah, uh, I courage. It takes courage, honesty. Um, one of the commonalities that you'll see within all of us is before we can take that journey to help others, we have to be selfish in taking that journey to be courageous with ourselves. And whether that looks like a filmmaker who is addressing demons from childhood and and fear, or whether it looks like a white supremacist who is uh, addressing a personality that is prone to shame and, and uh, being real with yourself, or whether it's a survivor who just lost their father in one of the worst race-based, at that time, race-based hate attacks that the states had seen in nearly 50 years to the hands of a white supremacist. Um, and at that time, you know, we didn't get we didn't get to get into that as much, but at that time, my my mother was also inside um, the temple, so I was very fortunate that she lived. I was ten minutes away from the temple itself, from losing my two children, and that that kind of fear takes a a toll on you on a day to day basis. So, uh, like, yeah, it takes a lot of courage and soul searching. What made you make the decision then? Why did you, why was it important to you? Um, I, I knew that I couldn't do this on my own. I knew that I could not, um, and I did my best. Uh, after a mass shooting happens, the survivors are usually, for one, they're in shock. Um, I'm sorry to say, but the United States almost has a protocol on mass shootings now. Uh, it's almost like every other month we have a mass shooting. Um, making the news, but when, when that happens to you, there's a difference between um, being watching the news and being the news, and and that and that's a that's there's an adrenaline that happens, of like I never want the world I never I never want to think that the world is happening to me, so my proactiveness was like I'm gonna happen to the world, I'm gonna. Give me the camera, give me, put it right here. No, we're not going to cower to this. We are fine as people. And, and whoever else is stuck in this other mindset, you don't get the camera. And so I'm, we're going to take control of the narrative. And so that was a lot of the adrenaline shortly after the shooting. But then you come to the realization that dad is gone. Mom is a widow. There's five other families who have lost their loved ones and their breadwinner. In this case, the breadwinner of their family, because a lot of the, the new immigrants, the, the woman didn't work at that time. And I'm like, what can we do to help these families at least sustain for the next two years? Let's have fundraisers. Let's raise money. Let's give it to them. So a lot of that just protocol. And over time, I just I realized, you're doing everything for everybody else. When did you have time to actually address your own fears and, and, and very much, uh, you know, I'm a therapist now, but at that time, the hypervigilance, the disassociation, this, the, the after trauma effects, the, 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 the acute trauma, the adjustment, you know, of, of life like that. And with that said, then I'm like, I really need to know why. Why did this happen? And I cannot ask the shooter because the shooter killed himself. Um, another traumatizing thing is not getting enough information from law enforcement. And I was law enforcement, I was ex-law enforcement, so I almost felt entitled to this information. And here I am saying, I'm not getting information. Why would somebody do something like this? And until that really gets answered, um, we're not satisfied. Survivors are not satisfied. 
So, I mean, even this whole movement of don't give them a platform or don't say zero tolerance. I, I think, you know, it's obviously watching this, watching this film. This film is a big part of survivors' recovery. It's not, this is not simply just about the perpetrator. This is about survivorship and getting voice. And that's what I think people are missing. This why is also what you were after, Dia. And, uh, and we see in the film that you go into this conversation with a very open and kind of non-combative uh, attitude with the movement. Uh, how, did the, the, how did they react and like, why, why did you do it in that way? Like, why didn't you just go in and argue with them? Because I've done that. I've done that most of my life. You know, I mean, even in Oslo, you know, I, I used to go to all the, the, the anti-fascist, anti-racist protests here when I was younger. And I used to throw stuff, I used to throw bottles, I used to shout at them, I used to you know, flip the finger, I used to do all of that. And here we are, decades later, and it hasn't really changed anything. So for me, on a personal level, I wanted to try something different. I've already done the shouting and the, and the yelling and the arguing and the pointing fingers. Um, and... and also, I know what their ideology, because a lot of people have said to me, why don't you go into the ideology? And the reason I don't go into the ideology, one, I already know what it is. I don't need some Nazi to tell me what Nazism is about. I, I, so, so that's already covered. And secondly, um, I don't want them to use my film as a recruitment tool for them. So... And also, I'm actually least interested in the ideology. When I did the jihadi film, you know, not to keep bringing that up, but there's just so many similarities. Same thing there. I was not interested in the ideology. I was interested in why an ideology like that is appealing to somebody. And in order to get to that, you have to get to the human being. You have to get to the beating heart of, of someone. Um, and also, most of these guys, they know how to respond and react to a combative stance. They already know that. They, they're well practiced, they know exactly how to do it, and they also know exactly how to benefit from it. They know how to come out victorious from an encounter like that. If I would have handed them their backside in an argument, they would have come out as the victim and it would have made them look good to their followers, or they would have handed me mine and they still look good. So that's not the level of conversation that I wanted to have. And so I would ask them about different things. Uh, and much more about them, and I would also uh, force them to sort of engage with my experiences and to see if they were able to see things from my eyes. Um, and, you know, Jeff Scoop, the, the leader of the National Socialist Movement, you know, you and I have talked about him before. Um, I mean, his condition when I first... First of all, most of these people did not want to speak to me. So I just want to put that out there as well, that in many ways the people who are in the film, it's sort of a self-selecting process anyway. It's, it's, it's the people who are okay sitting down with somebody like me, which most people were not. And uh, Jeff Scoop as well initially absolutely did not want to talk to me and eventually agreed and he said, okay, I'll meet with you. You have to come to my area. There's a particular motel. You come there and you have one hour. And five hours later, uh, he says to me, you know, we have this rally coming up and you know, you're welcome to join us. And I asked him why. Why is it okay for me to, you know, why does it go from one hour to I can now continue following you around? And he said, uh, because I respect the fact that you're sincere. And he said, and also you're asking me questions that nobody's ever asked me before. And he said, so it's making me think. And, and, and he said, I'm finding it interesting because I'm being challenged in different ways. He said, I don't agree with you and I don't share your vision of the world. Uh, but he said, but I respect the fact that you are sincere to your cause. And he said, I can see that you're also, you're not a journalist. I know that you're a filmmaker and also you're an activist. And he said, I respect the activist in you, even though your cause is incorrect. Uh, so we kind of bonded, <laughs> bizarrely, sort of bonded on that. And again, so he, he would have known how to deal with me if I would have come in swinging. He knows how to deal with that. He does not know how to deal with an empathetic engagement. And with him and also with some of the other interviews, we see this uh, hesitance kind of that he's unsure of the movement he's, he's part of. But, uh, but other people in the movie, you don't see that hesitance, like with uh, Spencer, for example. 
And I was wondering, is it um, because you didn't get as close to him, or is it uh, partly that he's not as willing to change, do you think? Or what? why do we see this difference in the characters in the, in the film, do you think? Well, my, so my purpose of making the film was not to change anybody's minds. That's, that's not my job, that was not really my intention. My, my intention was just to listen and to, to understand and to make sense of this. Um, I personally, I found, as you see in the film, there's a very distinct class difference within the movement. There's a very, very deep divide in that sense. And I, I found it much easier on a personal level to relate to the working class guys than I did the kind of elitist, rich, kind of spoiled guys. The Richard Spencers of, of the world, I, I would say their motivations for being in the movement is somewhat different from the Jeff Scoops and, and the other neo-Nazis, the kind of boots on the ground Nazis that I met. The, the motivation of somebody like Richard Spencer, the impression at least that I walk away with, is that it's much more about power. It's much more about him indulging in, in attention, him indulging in how he can make the media dance to his orders, uh, how he can become important and famous. Um, I mean, I think narcissism is much more sort of his reasoning not to say that it doesn't come from a place of hurt as well, somewhere in there. But I think, you know, a lot of the working class guys that I talk to with them, as you hear even in the film, you know, they, they have actually some legitimate grievances. You know, the, the, the socioeconomic challenges that the underclasses of America actually face. You know, there is a poor underclass in America that most people don't want to acknowledge. And it does exist. Um, the emotional, the psychological, the social issues that a lot of those men uh, were confronted with and were, were dealing with is different from a Richard Spencer. I would say Richard Spencer, it's much more about him. It's about him wanting to become famous. And I mean, several years ago, he used to run a shitty little website that nobody really cared about. But then the you know, American media got a hold of this guy and he knows exactly what to say to get attention. He knows exactly what to do to get huge glossy spreads in all kinds of magazines in America and he becomes America's sort of favorite villain. So you can't be the hero, but you'll, you'll, you'll accept being the villain. So that's very satisfying to him. Jared Taylor, the older man that you see, he's a bit different. I think, I mean, he also comes from you know very, very rich, very privileged background, but he is absolutely and utterly committed to the ideology. Richard Spencer is not, he's just found the ticket to get famous. Uh, whereas Jared Taylor is very, very, very dangerous, I would say, because he's utterly committed to the cause. Arna, from your knowledge of the movement, does this uh, ring true, I mean, and is it harder to change uh, some people from others? Yeah, I, I think it rings very true. Um, I, I think there's a, a very plain difference uh, in class, like from people within the movement. Um, I kind of get a kick out of Richard Spencer because, like, it, back in my day, we, we would have beat the dog shit out of him. <laughs> Why? I, because no one's gonna come in there in a fancy suit and then explain to me how he should he's natural to lead. <laughs> like, Nobody's beating or is be, like. Do you I, I'm saying like within the movement. Yeah. If, if he would have came to my group of guys and just like proclaimed himself the leader because he has a nice suit, <laughs> he would have been buried in that suit. Like, it's, it, and it, as, as, as we chuckle at the idea of Richard Spencer getting socked, as I do as well, I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody, um, I would point out that that video of him getting punched is what made him. That's what put him on six, 60 Minutes. That's what got him to be interviewed by Charles Barkley. So this idea that we can somehow punch Nazis out of existence is absolutely horrifically wrong. It, it gives them a platform as, as much as we like to you know, daydream about it. I don't blame anybody, I, I want to hit them too. But um, it, that, that distinction certainly comes into play. Uh, for me, the most dangerous guys I knew in the were guys who came from nothing. But but were, were kind of like had that Jared Taylor intellect along with the commitment to the ideology. And and then like the the street background to be very physically dangerous. I mean, like like yeah, I, I mean I, I came from a pretty cushy background, but it was it, it I, I think just my personality type 
lent itself more to, to violence than uh, uh, a Richard Spencer. Well, I mean, now we're talking a bit about getting an understanding of why people are attracted to these groups. Um, and we see the rise and growth of these groups, uh, not only in the US, but also in Europe and uh, also in Scandinavia. Um, I mean, what are, we, what are we doing wrong? Why are these groups growing? It's not only about childhood, but what is it about this moment in time that is making it grow? Um, I'm a Buddhist, so I'm really into like interdependence and our relationships with each other and with society and how like my actions affect all of you and how your actions affect me. And if we're talking about radicalization, you have to understand that it's a push and a pull process. So I start out by making this case, and Dia, please correct me if I'm wrong, having made the film Jihad. <clears throat> I, I'm very fortunate to work with a ton of former Islamist extremists who are now like risking their lives to keep us safe from violent extremism as we speak. They're amazing people. They're dear friends of mine. I love them. But working with them, I've come to understand the radicalization process in a broad sense, and it works exactly the same way for the so-called Islamic State as it does for the so-called alt-right. That being that ISIS will be pulling disaffected young Muslim youth towards them. They have all their slick propaganda videos, they have their whole routine, they have people who do nothing but recruit. So the pull factor is, is huge, it has to be there. But the pull alone will not work. It will not get them where they want to be. There has to be a push factor. So ISIS, basically, everything they do, every attack they conduct, and whoever does it, is meant to make life miserable for all 1.8 billion Muslims on the planet Earth. So that the rest of society pushes young Muslim people towards ISIS. And if you see like these anti-Sharia groups or Islamophobe trolls like Pam Geller in the States, like they are literally part of the recruitment process for ISIS, and they're a crucial part. Like I, Donald Trump is one of the biggest ISIS recruiters ever to walk the face of the earth. It, it, it's very sad. Now in the alt-right white supremacist world, there's an exact same dynamic happening. They, they have the poll, all these guys have their poll process, the push process is the far left. The push process is universities that say, you have to take this course on whiteness if you want to graduate and learn how horrible white people are and all the bad shit they've done throughout history. Like, you have to face all of that. And, and while there's very valid conversations to be had about that, like, we, we have not reconciled history and, and white supremacy has wrecked horrific damage on this planet for 500 years. I, I'm all about discussing that. But when you don't do it with mindfulness and, and the proper nuance that it deserves, it very quickly devolves to white people suck. And therefore, if you're, you're a white kid going to university, you can either confess your privilege and ask what hoops you need to jump through to be a proper ally, or you can jog off to join Richard Spencer on the alt-right. And it's way easier to do the latter. It's hard to like look at history and say, wow, like white people really did do a bunch of horrible shit. I, you know, that I didn't do it, but I'm I'm benefiting from it. Like that's hard to do. And the way our political climate is now is like the people who are proponents of that are like, well, if you don't do that, you're part of the problem. And so people like Ken Parker are gonna be like, fine, fuck you, I'm part of the problem then. It because it, it's it's way easier to do that, and that is what's driving this. Or it's a push pull factor, and if. The, I'm a left-leaning moderate myself. Uh, I think you guys in Scandinavia have, this is like how grown-ups do society. Um, <laughs> but, but that being said, I think it's all the more of an onus on the people who consider themselves progressive or consider themselves left-leaning to be like, hey, we got to make sure we're not fueling this. I mean, we also have the same debate in Norway as uh, it's going on on the university in the States, for example, on no platforming, the fact that you... Um, restrict the access to the public debate of certain voices or groups that have harmful views or arguments. 
Um, and right now, in the last two days, there's been a specific debate about this, and Dia, you've also been involved in this uh, debate here in the media in Norway, of whether or not we should restrict um, some uh, nationalist uh, people from the debate because their arguments are so harmful. What, what do you think about this debate, Pardit, from your experience? Does this work? I mean, can it work to kind of restrict access in the, in the fair that it will give them a bigger platform? Um, as, as, as a therapist, I would say it's not going to work. If you... Access needs... It needs we need to have responsible access. And I think that's what this film does. And so we all need to understand our responsibility. Um, the word, and, and I understand there's a lot of clinicians in here, but the word stress diathesis keeps coming to mind. And stress... To the sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, I will. So basically, there, there's, a, there's a biological predisposition that certain people have, um, much more than other people. And, and then there's environmental factors that... So a life, that, a life plus biological factors increases the chances of vulnerability to committing a violent act. And we are seeing um, we are seeing the rise of that in the states all over the place. And one of the things that we do is we go talk to schools and kind of consult about how do we prevent the next mass shooting. Sounds morbid, doesn't it? But what we say is look for the person who feels rejected. Rejection, whether it's real or perceived, it is real to that person very much real. And now we're speaking about the same thing of saying, well, no, no exposure for you. Let's just reject your existence. And, and, and I'm, I fear that that's going to even, that's going to create a more dangerous um, type of person that's going to go unaddressed, un, unable to see a film like this and see themselves in it and say, oh, you know what? I do suffer from sh deep shame mechanisms where I internalize uh, uh, things and I'm more sensitive. How many of you guys have, uh, uh, have ever witnessed little children? Or our parents? Or have seen little children going around? <laughs> Most everybody in here? Okay, so I got four kids and three boys. And I will tell you, my oldest boy, uh, his name's Jay, he has much more of an internalization me mechanism. Meaning, if I tell Jay, Jay, why did you do that to your sister? he will just think it's all about himself and he will just go off and run off in his room. And he'll cry and he'll, you know, pout. I tell my next son, I'm like, Ro, why did you do that to your sister? And he's like, oh, because I was, having, I was just mad. And, but he doesn't run away. He doesn't hide. He doesn't even internalize it. So now two kids born from the same parents have a different spiritual context. And one suffers with shame. Shame being like, Shame and guilt, right? Guilt being, I did something wrong, what we're always doing, and shame being, I am wrong. Now, the one that I am wrong uh, is the one to like, look out for. That's, that's the one that, that's going to come around and say, well, yeah, I'm going to do something super desperate because I'm not getting noticed. I feel rejected by society. So, in my, in my opinion, I think it's just going to create a more dangerous shame mechanism person. To not include them in the debate, you mean? Exactly. To... I mean, there is a responsibility on the ones having the debate as well. One of the arguments for not necessarily including is that the people who are opposed will be afraid to join. Like, we've had this debate in Norway with a very famous activist, young activist with a Somali background, who's been afraid of joining the debate because she's faced so much harassment. Like, I mean, how do we include the debate how do we make an inclusive debate without increasing the harassment or enforcing these kind of views? Yeah, this is your job, I guess, as a filmmaker. Well, I don't know about that, but, but you know, I mean, I completely understand that the trauma associated to being the subject of harassment. So I completely understand what she's saying. You know, it's it's. You almost don't want to participate because the, the consequences and the price that you pay for participating in, in any kind of public discourse has become so. Uh, horrible, especially for I think women and particularly women of color. I think it's become very, very harsh. So I completely understand what she's feeling and what she's saying, and I actually recognize it in myself too. Um, 
But I do think, I mean, for me, you know, should people like this be given any kind of coverage in our public space? I think rather than the question of should they be given any kind of coverage, I lean more towards what you're saying is it's a matter of what kind of coverage they're given that is important. You know, it's, as I said earlier, it was important for me to engage with men like this while being very, very sensitive to the fact that I do not want them to just go ahead and use my film for their own recruitment. Um, you know, to me, you know, if the engagement that one has with groups like this or with jihadis or with anyone that, you know, has, you know, holds extreme and, and, and violent views is, you know, are we normalizing this type of, their type of ideology? You know, are we glamorizing it? And I would say that a lot of the coverage that a lot of these types of groups get does actually glamorize it by the extent of attention that they're given. I mean, not to keep harping on about Richard Spencer, but the amount of attention that he gets, it's like a rock star. I mean, he's on, he's on the cover of everything, he gets huge spreads everywhere, and, and I think that that's actually irresponsible. Personally, I find that irresponsible. So to me, it's a matter of how do you engage? Is that engagement critical? Is that engagement just to let somebody spew in one direction whatever hateful things that they want to say? Or are you holding somebody's feet to the fire and having a real conversation? And are you being critical and are you actually challenging them? Um, so I, I think it's, for me, it's not so much a matter of should people like this be given a platform and should they be given coverage? It's how do you cover them that is important. We will soon open up for questions from the audience, so feel free to think of uh, how to formulate them. Um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the work you guys are doing uh, now as well. I mean, the two of you have started an organization where you try to uh, prevent people from going into extremist movements. Uh, how do you do this work and what can we learn from it? Uh, yeah, so the, the work that we do, uh, the organization was called Surf to Unite. And Surf to Unite was formed because of what happened. And, uh, and really a calling to the Midwest that uh, the Midwest, where we, were, where we were situated, and I think Dia could tell this when she went into town, but um, that neighborhood is a growing demographic of non-Latino um, immigrants, so Asian Pakistani, Indian, uh, you know, you, you name it, and that area is kind of uh, uh, coming the epicenter of that. And so when, when that happened, it was basically saying, uh, you know, you had a white supremacist who was telling immigrants, and, and not even words, but actions, that not only are you not allowed into this country, but you're not allowed on the face of this earth. That's how much I devalue your people. And so Surf to Unite was formed to say, you know what, we have to start seeing the worth of everybody. And that just doesn't include just us. Because th this us doesn't happen without you. And so when I'm watching Dia's film, I'm noticing the first guy that comes on starts to talk about my people. My people. And that's an illusionary thought. That's just, a, we're living in worldly illusions of what is my people? What is us? And, and then first and foremost, we have to do that deep dive within ourself. And says, I'm not going to go out and, and, and work on other people and help other people if I can't even challenge my ideas of what our people are. And we should all ask ourselves that before we leave. Before we leave. Um, so Serve to Unite was this form to kind of, kind of say, okay, let's go into those deeper dives and these deeper discussions of who we are and, and what will come will come back to understand that like we are all just human beings and that's what unites us. And as far as the nuts and bolts of what we do, Serve to Unite does arts driven service learning and global engagement. Explain, please. <laughs> so the best way to describe service learning is it's actual hands on service out there doing something in the community that's positive, that solves a problem, and then connecting it to classroom curriculum. So if I get a bunch of kids together, we walk through a neighborhood and pick up litter, like that service, it's great, makes the place nicer. But if I do that and then we go back to the classroom and we study like where does litter come from? What different kinds of litter are there? What can we do to it? How can we reduce it? Where does it go? And then we go pick up the litter, like that's service learning. And it's actually a really beautiful field because you can honestly 
take any form of service, any form of curriculum, connect it, and boom, you got service learning. An example in our program, and, and over the years, our students have addressed things like Islamophobia, like racism, homophobia, homelessness, human trafficking, po community police relations, environmental issues, and these are all like student-driven initiatives. So we ask our young people, like, hey, what are you concerned about? And they say, we want to address Islamophobia. We had a group from a Catholic high school who specifically stated that. And so we connected with one of our global mentors, a brilliant woman named Yasmin Molikas in Hoonslow, UK. Dia knows her well. And Yasmin's one of my favorite people. She's just this awesome personality. We brought Yasmin into our classroom via Skype, and from England, she advised our Catholic high school students on how to connect with the Muslim community of Milwaukee. Following Yasmin's advice, our students reached out, they contacted an imam, asked if we could visit the mosque, learn more about Islam, tell them more about Catholicism. We did that, had an amazing afternoon together. Our students ate lunch with the kids from the Salam school. And then our students pitched a service project to the mosque, which was gathering food and clothing for homeless veterans of the United States military. We partnered with a great org called Veterans Outreach of Wisconsin that serves that population, organized a food drive that went on for two, three months, and over that time gathered like tons of food and clothing, <coughs> sanitary items, and like good stuff. It wasn't like that can of mandarin oranges that's been on your shelf for 10 years. Like, the, the people at the mosque were going out shopping and buying, like, nice items, buying underwear, buying socks, shampoo, toothbrushes, toothpaste, and served this population that needed help. So that was first and foremost the intention. We want to help these veterans of the U.S. military. No matter where you stand politically, these are people who are damaged and harmed from their service, and they need help. We're going to help them. But beyond that, we've now included the Muslim population in something that's very near and dear to a lot of Americans, which is helping veterans of the U.S. military. Also, changing this paradigm to where these Islamophobes are going to say, Muslims are terrorists and they hate America and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm happy to have that discussion with you, but it's, right now I have to go to the mosque to pick up the two tons of food and clothing that they gathered for homeless veterans. By the way, how much food and clothing have you gathered for homeless veterans in the past month? So that, that's an, a beautiful example of how our students, through service learning, through Global Connection, and they, they, they painted a huge mural for the, the vets at their center, tied get that arts element in there. That's one example of what Surf United has done. Inspiring. <laughs>